The recap today will be on the movie, There's Someone Inside Your House. We start off when Jackson pulls up to his family's farmhouse with the music blasting. As soon as he makes his way inside, he gets call from a friend where they discuss about girls in the upcoming football game that evening. While they do so, he makes his way to the kitchen to grab a bag of open chips to munch on. The lad notices an egg timer on the kitchen table as well as the house being a little too quiet, so he puts his friend on hold for a moment while he calls to his mom and sister but gets no response. Thinking nothing of it, he carries on his conversation and ends it in his bedroom as he wants to get some sleep before the big game. Later that evening, he's woken up by the alarm of the egg timer to his confusion because he didn't bring it up with him. Jackson quickly turns on his room light and rushes to leave since he's running late for the game but he finds the house door open. He drops his bag to the ground when he realizes that his car and phone are also missing. Jackson goes back inside where he locks the door and calls the emergency services, but he freezes in disbelief when he sees a picture of him and one of his teammates on the kitchen cabinet. He ends the call and crumples the picture, the phone begins to ring but he ignores it. As he moves through the house destroying more pictures of that night, the contents of the pictures get more disturbing. It leads him to his parents' room, he enters and hears his phone ringing coming from the walk-in closet so he grabs his dad's golf club and threatens the culprit claiming they don't know what happened that night. You ain't got the answers, man. Jackson enters the room to find pictures of him assaulting his teammate, he takes a few wild swings whilst calling for the culprit to come out. He gets his wish as his Achilles tendon gets sliced ending his football career if he survives this ordeal. The culprit emerges with a mask of Jackson's face and finishes him off slasher style. His dad calls to know his whereabout as they are all at the game. Suddenly, a video is sent to everybody's phone depicting Jackson's assault on the team member. Through the students gossiping, it is revealed that the victim in the video was Caleb, a homosexual player on the team, and they speculate that he might have had Jackson killed for revenge. A couple of days after the shocking news, Makani leaves a get well soon card at his memorial as her friends tease her, but she explains all the other cards were sold out, as they discuss Macon begins to sing as he remembers his friend. During lunchtime, Makani and her friends speculate on who the culprit could be, Darby calls Caleb over to their table when they see that he's been shunned by his teammates. Makani introduces herself and her friends, but the whole canteen is interrupted when Katie the narcissistic student council president gives a tone death speech using her college admission letter. After which, she leads the students in prayer in preparation for the memorial the following day. As they put their heads down, Makani notices Oliver staring at her. After school the gang makes their way to Zach's car which has been vandalized because his rich family is hated for buying the farmland of the local families when they are at their most desperate. He's not really offended because he understands their frustration. The friends prepare to move off to have some recreational fun when Oliver blocks their way. Alex comments that he's the most likely murderer suspect as everyone sees him as a sociopath. That night, Makani has dinner with her grandma where it is revealed that the old lady suffers from a sleep disorder, so she has signed up for treatment. Grandma is more worried about Makani as the recent events at school might have triggered some painful memories pertaining to her past. Makani is a bit worried about her college application because all people have to do is Google her real name to learn what happened. Her granny assures that it's all in the past, so she needs to move on. Makani goes to her room to write some poetry when she receives a message from Oliver, but she ignores it. She looks through some pictures of the two of them and it seems like they were in a secret relationship. Makani puts her phone down to sleep when a message comes through from Oliver saying she can't ignore him forever. Grandma wakes her later on in the night when she has another sleep episode. The young lady comes down to kitchen items all over the place and the back door open. She gets startled when Granny appears out of nowhere but she wakes her from her sleepwalking. The following morning is Jackson's memorial service and Katie is there early with Marcus setting up. She speculates that Caleb is the mastermind behind the murder. When she asks for his opinion she's surprised to see that he has disappeared. She then gets a message from Marcus explaining that he's sick so he can't make it. As she calls him confused, someone locks the door. Katie asks him to drop the act because she was just talking to him. The school president ends the call when a racist segment from her anonymous podcast starts playing in the church hall. She turns to find the killer standing there with a mask of her face on. Katie tries to explain herself but she's cut across her stomach when trying to escape. She struggles and hides inside a confession booth where she makes an emergency call, but the killer gets to her by lodging the blade through her mouth. The pastor opens the door to Katie's body hanging while her hate speech plays in the background. The sheriff addresses the town through a special broadcast assuring citizens that the killer will be caught, he also imposes an 8 p.m. curfew. Meanwhile Makani gets worried and googles her real name, she gets a flashback of her in handcuffs, but she snapped out of it when a call from a drugged up Rodrigo comes in. He expresses his frustration about the whole situation and his inability to confess his feelings for Alex. The following day, students at the high school are all brought in for questioning. Everyone gets annoyed at Zach when he gets off free because his dad's lawyer did lawyer stuff to prevent him from getting questioned. 
He leaves the station where Dave the town's Uber driver tries to give him his card, but he gets ignored. Zack's dad awaits and points for him to get in where he berates him for smoking the hash hash and going to the police station knowing full well they are not liked in the town. He dismisses him and asks him to get rid of the graffiti from the car as it is embarrassing. Makani and Oliver are the only two left to be interrogated. She tries her best to stay busy on her phone but Oliver catches her attention by having a conversation playing the role of both him and her. He moves closer to her where it is revealed that they had a summer fling, but it meant more for Oliver. She ghosted him when school resumed because she didn't want to be seen with him which would ruin her already non-existent reputation. Their conversation ends when she's called by the deputy for questioning. She is tensed but manages to hold it together and eventually released without incident. The young lady decides to leave with Oliver despite the curfew. They park in a driveway where they start getting too handsy, but the fun is cut short when someone runs and hits the car door. Oliver recognizes the guy and soon after more people start running on the street cheering. Makani gets a notification alerting her that Zack is throwing a secret party. The two lovebirds decide to also go. Uber Dave is around handing out his card in case any of the drunk teens need a lift home. The couple make their way inside the mansion where people are telling their secrets to one another. Zack explains that by having people do this they are removing the only thing the killer is using to hunt for his victims. Rodrigo sarcastically points out that the killer still has his very sharp knife. Alex and Rodrigo then berate Oliver for looking at them. They call him a creep and sociopath which makes Makani a little uncomfortable. He just quietly turns away. Darby confesses to everyone that she's been accepted into NASA. Alex and Rodrigo confess to liking each other. Makani discloses that she writes poetry and Zack reveals he's doing poorly at school. He pulls out a vintage gun which startles everyone, and he continues to scare his guests by putting it in his mouth, but when he pulls the trigger, he blows out smoke to everybody's relief. Zack then gathers the party goers and gives them various World War artifacts he has turned into smoking utensils. This takes the party to the next level as they smoke and dance, Alex and Rodrigo decide to go for a private dance but they are briefly interrupted by Macon who wants some chips from the kitchen. After the new couple finishes, they part ways but Rodrigo notices some of his painkillers on the floor, he follows the trail to a bottle of pills. When he picks it up everybody gets a message exposing him as a drug addict. The light in the house suddenly goes off to everyone's confusion. The place becomes chaotic when someone announces that the killer is wearing Rodrigo's face. As the students rush out the house the killer closes in on Rodrigo, but he manages to hide in a closet. His phone rings at the worst possible time which gives his locations away. He escapes through the vent as the killer stabs through the metal. Rodrigo breathes a sigh of relief thinking he's escaped when he makes it out the house, but the killer uses a taser to stun him, then shoves some pills down his throat, before cutting it. The group are devastated as they mourn his death through the school break, during that period Makani continues to see Oliver. Soon after school is back in session, everyone now thinks that Oliver is behind the murders. Makani gets into a fight with Alex when she doubles down that her sneaky link is the killer. Later, her grandma leaves for the sleep treatment and reminds her to stay at Alex's place while she's gone. Makani decides to stay at the house alone, one afternoon she's taken out by Oliver to Zack's family farm on a date. Their make-out session is interrupted when Oliver's brother calls, she excuses herself into the car where she comes across a taser in his glove box. Oliver joins her in the car where he reveals his past and hints that he knows Makani's real name and past. She storms off when she figures that he did a background check on her, she calls Uber Dave to come pick her up. As soon as Makani gets home, she locks the door and picks a knife. She also blocks the room door with a chair before dozing off. She's woken up by a flashback to find her knife and phone gone. The young lady calls for her grandma knowing full well it's the killer. She rushes downstairs and calls the emergency services but a voice recording of her giving her statement regarding her past plays. A terrified Makani makes her way into one of the rooms where pictures of a burn victim is plastered all over the wall as the flames from the fireplace light up the room. The killer watches from the outside window as she confronts her past. He busts through the window and shoots her with a taser which stuns her to the ground. He then proceeds to pour fuel all over her, as he prepares to set her ablaze, a car pulls up. This takes his attention which allows her to knock him down. The mask falls off as the killer escapes, Alex made it just in time, thanks to her grandma's call to check. Before she loses consciousness, she claims Oliver is the killer. Makani wakes up at the hospital with her friends and grandma around her. They alert her that Oliver has been arrested, but the killer has exposed her dark past to the public. She explains to her friends that seniors at her old high school sports team got the juniors drunk and tried to pit them against one another, there was bonfire nearby and she accidentally pushed a teammate inside, the girl didn't die but she got severe burns. The death threats were too much, so Makani decided to transfer to this quiet town. Her new friends console her and inform her they know she's a good person as they hug it out. Some time has passed and Makani is back to full health, the festive period approaches, and the last bus to the Sanford corn farm maze leaves. 
Alex alerts her that they will come back to pick her up. While she waits, she gets a message from Darby informing her that Oliver is out from jail since his brother is the deputy sheriff. She sees his car pulling up, so she runs into the school where she bumps into Caleb, he gets stabbed just as he tells her that everyone is waiting outside for them. The killer then gives her the knife before leaving. Oliver runs over to see if she's fine. It is confirmed that he's not the killer, he quickly tries to stop Caleb's bleeding as the others join them. A spaced out Makani realizes the killer is going to strike the corn maze next, he's already there and he's preparing to set the crops ablaze. After sending Caleb to the hospital, they received word that he'll survive as they make their way to the corn maze. Makani finally gets hold of Zack who fanatically alerts them that the place is on fire. They see it as they get closer, Oliver uses his car to clear a path through the fire for people to escape but it gets stuck, so they are forced to abandon it. Oliver grabs his taser but before they set off, Alex and Darby help the people trapped inside to find their way out. Dead bodies line the maze as Oliver and Makani try to find the killer, but they see him confronting Zack's dad. The couple are unable to save him as the killer lodges a blade through his face. It is revealed that Zack is the killer as he removes his mask complaining that they ruined his moment. Oliver tries to taser him but it doesn't fire, so the killer rams the blade into his torso, he tries to justify his killing and explains how he's going to frame Makani after killing her. Oliver manages to shoot the taser giving Makani the chance to put a permanent end to Zack. In the aftermath, Oliver survives and is open about dating Makani, Alex also gets admission to university. At their high school graduation, Makani gives her best-in-class speech to everyone's applause.